Uh, thank you for coming to this seminar. And um, I'm very, I'm very honored to invite, introduce the Pedro. Uh, that he is uh, my long term, long time collaborator. Also, he is now in the assistant professor in Chicago University. And then he's, I, as far as I know, he's a top researcher <laughs> of the human computer integration. So I believe that uh, in the OIST, so not so many computer human integration or human computer interaction research coming on. But I, I think that's very interesting to, you know, coming up together for some intersection of the pure science or some biology or some other research background and computer interaction. I think that's might be creates many interesting the chemicals among the many researches. So as uh, a slight small advertisement from my side, so recently we are starting the humanity, cybernetic humanity studio in Lab 5, which is a collaboration between OIST and Sony CSL. And I am a living, uh, I am a staying in the Sony, uh, sorry, the Lab 5, then to running that the studio. So as, uh, as a part of this activity, uh, sometimes my folks or some like a great researcher come to OIST. So maybe therefore coming years, maybe we will also have some other seminar like this kind of uh, computer human uh, interaction related seminars. So uh, let me introduce again the Pedro as uh, <laughs> assistant professor in Chicago University. And then title is integrating interface interactive devices with body. So he's a uh, kind of top research uh, of the human integrate human computer integration and then now please start your talk. Yeah, thank you. I hope you can all hear me and the folks on Zoom can hear me too, but if there's something that is not working out, you can say so and we'll we'll fix it. So thanks Shinichi for the for the kind introduction. I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that I do at the University of Chicago. I'm in the Department of Computer Science and indeed uh, we're going to talk about how to integrate devices with the body. Now before the talk gets too abstract we start to like debate what the word integrating really means. And, you know, is it biological integration, is it chemical, whatever, is it just electronics? I want to start with one short teaser example, just so you kind of get a sense of what I mean when it say an interface becomes integrated. So here's a device that I made during my PhD a while ago. It's called Muscle Plotter. It uses a pen that is able to digitize everything you draw. And what you see here is two car designers doing what car designers normally do. They sketch shapes of cars and they discuss which of these are more aerodynamic. Normally to find which one is more aerodynamic to find the answer to that, they have to go to a simulator, usually a desktop computer running some complex wind flow simulations, some fluid dynamics, and they run that in the simulator and they would find which of the shapes is most aerodynamic. But notice that over here, this user, the ones currently drawing, somehow is actually drawing the output of the wind flow simulator, this is cross section of how the wind would flow through the shape of that car. And in reality, this user doesn't know the answer, of course. That's why we need simulators. These complex fluid dynamics are a little bit counterintuitive to the human brain. You know, there's turbulence, all kinds of things. So the way that they are knowing or they're outputting that they're drawing the simulated lines of the wind flow is that they're leading their bodies be under control for a computer. I don't know if you can see these electrode patches attached to the muscles. There's a computer system in the back end that has taken the drawing, has simulated how the wind virtually would flow through that, computed these flow lines, and now is controlling the wrist with electrical impulses to the left or to the right so as to make the user automatically drop. So the user just seating control and just saying, hey, for a moment, take control of my body, make this an output. That's why I call it muscle plotter because your muscles are the plotter. So you know, if this was like an exam question and now you're starting to see what I mean when I say the word integration, and I would let, say, you know, point out all the hardware components that are comprised of the system. You would say, you know, the pen, some special digitizer pen, it's called it a noto pen. You would say, clearly there's a computer in the back end that we can't see, there's extra special paper as well. But at some point you would be forced to say the muscles as well, right? Of course, the electrodes, of course, the stimulator, there's a medical stimulator that does all this, but the muscles, because without the muscles, there would be no movement. Without the movement, there would be no plotting, right? It'd be like a half display. So there'll be no interaction. So that's what I mean with integrating a device with a human body, some sort of like very low level physiological integration. Now, I hope you're all wondering like, why on earth would a computer scientist, you know, stimulate people's muscles as a means to try to explore the frontier of interfaces. And, and the reason why I do this has a lot to do with a trend that I see in the evolution of the types of interfaces that we interact with. 
Right, I could start the story anywhere. I really like to start it very early on. The first computers took up entire rooms, really, really large mainframe computers. It was like one user smaller than the whole infrastructure for the computer, right? And the interface components are actually really, really, really small. Most of the computer was just computing power. You know, you had a little oscilloscope screen at max or punch cards to input and output with the computer. And then all of a sudden in the 70s, 60s, there was a revolution in interfaces, which we still thrive on today. I mean, some people here on their laptops because it's such a powerful interface to have computers with us during our office time. You can imagine that the type of things that were possible before were only when you went to the computing room one hour a day to this university, you put your punch cards and you came the next day. That was a very short window of interaction. With desktop computers, all of a sudden office working got revolutionized because people spend six hours a day in their office with a computer. Very different type of things we were able to do. And of course, you know where this goes, right? Like this is apparently the number one selling interface in the whole world. There's more smartphones than people by now, by like a large tenfold number. And of course, the things you can do with a smartphone are very different than the things you can do with a desktop because, you know, I'm walking around Okinawa and I don't know where to go, but I can have information anywhere, anytime. And all of you know the story. I've already seen some people have a wearable smartwatch. Again, smartwatches are another point that is really interesting in the evolution of interfaces that you could say, oh, well, Pedro, that's really simplistic. You know, you just <laughs> put some Velcro strap and put your mobile phone here. That, that should change nothing. But it does change something because these things are in physical contact with your skin. So the type of application use cases this enables is things where, you know, people are walking around, it's measuring how many steps, it's measuring your heart rate, some physiological signals like blood oxygenation or something like that, right? Because it's 24 seven being able to read or sleep monitoring, that sort of thing, right? So you see that every step of this evolution, new things are possible. I'm really interested in what's possible with the next step. Like if we go here, <laughs> what is gonna be possible at the next step? And more importantly, how is that next step gonna look like? If it's not gonna look like mobile, not gonna look like wearables, how is it gonna look like? And I think you can already spot what I'm doing here with these bubbles, right? The small bubble is the user, and, or sorry, the small bubble is the device, larger bubble is the user, and you can see that it's sort of like intersecting each other, right? With the wearable devices, is just this barrier of skin sensing, right? Measuring the skin, but what would happen if these two elements would actually overlap, and to some degree they would integrate into each other? And that's what I'm exploring, and I call integrated devices with the body, and that example that I'm showing you, the video of these two people drawing cars, where they were feeling their muscles being moved to output the information. That was a very extreme case of this integration because the device and the user form sort of one device, right? And so in the, in the examples that will follow throughout the talk, you will see devices that are intentionally designed like this to really borrow parts of the user's body, sometimes biological, sometimes physiological, to use that as input or output to a computer device. And that allows for very different kinds of uh, devices to be built. So I'll show you a few examples. Um, one type of research we've been doing a lot with in my lab with this idea of integrating devices with the body is to explore the sort of next frontier of virtual reality interfaces. Um, so all the works you see here are regarding virtual reality because we're at a really, really interesting point in time right now. I don't know how many of you have tried a VR headset, but we're kind of at a point where you walk to a shop, you buy a VR headset. In the US, you can just buy it at you know, the most default supermarket. You put it on, you look at something like this, and it actually feels very believable to your eyes. It creates a sufficiently photorealistic illusion. And by the way, what you're seeing here is not even, you know, high quality video games or Disney <laughs> research and Pixar level things. This is a two, two virtual scenes that my student Jazz has made in like a night. But you put the VR headset on and you feel like you're transported visually to that desert, or you feel like you're transported to the snowy mountain, you walk around, you move around, everything feels very congruent. As you move, the view moves, it's beautiful, until you sort of test the limits of VR. And this is kind of where we are with commercial VR today, which is you see that wall of the shed in that virtual mountain, you try to push against it and you're like, okay, well, <laughs> VR is gone now because I feel no physicality, there was no force. And it's very hard, it's very difficult for the VR headset to generate that infinite force that a wall would provide backwards as you push through it. Now, for the folks that know a little bit more about the history of robotics and maybe some human computer interaction, you're wondering like, wait a second, I've seen stuff. And Shinichi does a lot of work with robotics too. So you may be wondering, I've seen things that 
can generate the force sensation of a wall. We just need some kind of mechanical device like a robotic arm, or in this case, an exoskeleton to push against the user. So what you're seeing here is one of my favorite exoskeletons of all times called UL7. And this person is playing with that ball in VR, right? They're not wearing the headset, but this is what they're doing, right? They're moving the ball up and down the incline. And there's motors at every joint that's sort of geared up and push against your body. So I'm like, the person is trying to push the ball and they feel like some form of gravity is acting on the ball. If the ball is on the incline, it's harder to move because the motor pushes against the body. So you could say the problem solved, live, that's awesome. Let's just sell this with a VR headset at all the supermarkets. And now you start wondering why this doesn't sell so well. And you're like, yeah, well, it's a large stationary infrastructure. It's really power consumption heavy, it's et cetera, et cetera. It's just really bulky type of device, right? It's very precise. Well, I'm happy to talk about all the advantages too. I don't want to feel like I'm bashing on exoskeletons. This is really one of my favorites. But that size limitation is completely at odds with what you can go and experience in VR. Sort of the consumer model is searching for a VR space where people are untethered, there's no cables. Even the tracking is beautifully done from inside the headset. You don't even have to have physical infrastructure for tracking. So if you go and ask users, hey, you can have a really immersive experience in VR, you just need to wear an exoskeleton. They're like, yeah, maybe I'm not gonna do that and sacrifice a living room for batteries and all that stuff. So it's a fun problem. And you know, if, if, if folks here have a physics brain too, you'll, you'll find this problem kind of fun because you could argue, well, let's make the motor smaller. And then you all know that motors obey a stupid law of physics that if you make them smaller, their output force diminishes, their battery consumption also diminishes, but the output force diminishes. If you reduce the gear ratio as well, that's also not what we wanna do. So it's a little bit of a catch problem where you can't really just miniaturize this that trivially and have an output force that is still sufficient for these highly immersive, realistic types of haptics, right? But we would like to have a nice output force, less weight, less battery, less power consumption. So the turn that I'm taking in my work is a little bit different. It's more biologically inspired and it's to say, we already have ways in the body to very efficiently move, you know, it's our muscle system, right? So we could tap into that and rather than actuating motors electrically, externally, we could try to internally actuate the body. This technique is called electrical muscle stimulation. This is not something that I've invented or the field of HCI has invented. This is born in like medical rehabilitation in the 60s or even a little bit before you could argue. And typically it's done for rehabilitation purposes. Say you have spinal cord injury, you can't move your arm or you have your leg in a cast and you want to rehabilitate your muscles after removing it from the cast. Very often people go to clinics, they apply these patches, these little electrodes. The doctor is twisting the knobs, control like a nice setup for your muscles to react. And that's how it works. Now we're doing slightly different because we're putting the computer in the loop. The computer can sense where he wants to move your body and is in real time controlling. There's no doctors, there's no knobs, right? It's an interactive system. And so just to give you an example, for example, if I would move these two or pass a little current through these two electrodes here, what would actually happen is the current sort of traverses through the inside of the body over here, catches some muscle fibers in between, they electrically actuate. And for example, if I would move those two over there, I don't know why this is not moving, I would have this sort of extensor contraction. So my wrist would go up. And then if you notice in this particular system, there's an accelerometer in my wrist so the system can know how much contraction, how much output, let's not say contraction, how much output is happening. And so it can self-regulate itself. It wants to move 20 degrees, it waits to get to 20 degrees and then turns off at 20 degrees, right? So very simple closed loop muscle stimulation system. Now that we have this idea, let's just see why my slides aren't moving, there we go. We can go back to that vision of, oh, can I walk around in VR? and have a physical type of experience without having to carry that exoskeleton around. So this is work that I did in my PhD with Patrick Bodish at HPI. So what you see here is a user walking around VR, encountering all kinds of walls that their hands cannot penetrate. So their hands get repelled by this invisible force, which just happens to be the force of their own muscles. Over there, he was pressing a button and that button had the sense of resistance, like a spring inside, like uh, it's hard to push. There are some projectiles. Try to also get the sound running for the next video. Um, and then this, this one is really fun. I actually showed this at SIGGRAPH and, and I think June and, and Shun were there that year. And when you pick up these boxes, there's a sort of type of gravity, meaning when you pick up the box, 
your hands involuntarily kind of fall, go down electrically, you have to push them up. And it's this interaction of these two forces that kind of feels like gravity. And it's really satisfying when you throw it and like kind of release that force. People love that one. So when you put these two things together, what I'm kind of trying to explore here, if you could only remember one thing from my talk, is this idea that maybe what I'm doing is not to add more electronics to the body, to externally induce sensations. For example, I'm not trying to create the wall by pushing with an external motor. I'm searching for like the minimum set of components that can internally make the user's biology create those sensations, but sort of from within. And what I'm gonna argue is that a lot of times we find very interesting pathways to the body. And this one is muscle-wise. I'll show a few others later that are electrical, a few others later that are chemical, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not gonna show a lot of hardware, so I decided to just put like one slide so you can see what's actually inside of one of these bracelets and see that this, you know, there's no rocket science here, really. This is just a microprocessor, typically has some form of wireless. In this case, it has Bluetooth. Um, this is the sort of core of these devices, a medical grade muscle stimulator, just like the ones that the doctors have in the clinic, except instead of twisting knobs here, we have some control circuitry that is twisting the knobs digitally, you know, at the request of the VR application or of the request of whatever application. And there's some batteries. Now, these components here, the electrodes, right? The stuff you stick onto your skin and conduct the impulses to the muscles. This is what's fun. Like this part we can't miniaturize because we maybe need certain size, right? Like if muscles have five centimeters width, then you need an electrode five centimeters width. But the stuff over there, it's subjected to Moore's law. This is just electronics. There's no physics here. There's no mechanical components here. So this is really, really easy to miniaturize. This is the stuff I could do when I was a PG student. It's like bulky and huge. Uh, my students are much better. So this is a device that June also helped create when he was in my lab. And this is exactly the same type of stimulator that is over there, but it's so small that we can fit into someone's septum just at the beginning of the nose. Well, we're not actuating muscles, but we're doing the same thing, just using it to stimulate the sense of smell. So you can see how small that stuff can be. The only thing you can't miniaturize here is the electrodes, but that's fine. They're soft, they're flexible. They're adapting very well, conforming to the body. It's a good problem to have. Um, all right. I'll show you just one more application of what we do with this idea of electrical stimulation as an alternative to robotics, and then I'll switch gears to different things. Um, one last one, this is uh, work we did last year from my student, Yudai Tanaka, he's a PhD student, and here he's trying to help people acquire skills in a more embodied manner. So not, I don't know how you folks do here, the sort of fire safety training, but at U Chicago, we had to do it every year and typically just means you watch a video, on your browser and after a minute they're like hey, check you've done fire safety training and you know you and i were always well i don't think people really learn what to do in the panic of a moment where there's a fire breaking out in the lab so this demo here actually puts you in a fire safety drill sort of in first person the fire is simulated you see it in augmented reality and then what he's failing to do is to find the fire extinguisher that's the next step he doesn't see it at the moment and so we electrically stimulate the muscles of the neck to turn his head and acquire the target, in this case, the fire extinguisher. And I invite you to watch the rest of this. this is all on YouTube. All our videos are on YouTube. This one is really fun because he's going to put out like three fires and then there's a fire in the ceiling. And if you don't know the rules, fire in the ceiling means stop putting out fires, escape the building. And then his head also follows the escape route, which he doesn't know and doesn't remember. And it's hard. We had fires in the lab. It's, it's actually like your heart starts racing. You forget, forget everything that you've trained. And I think this type of embodied experience really helps with that. Again, I'm not saying you were the first people to actuate the neck. Many colleagues in you know, neurology and rehabilitation have done this millions of times with robots. Again, robotic exoskeletons. All I'm saying here is that this is a much more interesting form factor, even for rehabilitation, because there's no hardware above the neckline. This is very, very slim, very miniaturized. All right, so I'm gonna close this chapter on, on mechanical force feedback. I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of where I was when I actually started my lab in 2019 at the University of Chicago, which is I had done that work in my PhD, the VR walls one, and I was thinking whether this type of idea of integration is really just about muscles. And that's the end. I would have been happy. All I can do is integrate devices with the muscles. Awesome. Some kind of new wearables that can connect to muscles. Or could we do this trick of integrating with senses with other modalities? say with a sense of temperature. So this work that you see now is, comes back to these two scenes and asks the obvious question. If I wanna put you in a VR desert and if it doesn't feel hot, like you were talking about Okinawa feeling really hot, 
we've tried that. People just say like, yeah, it looks really nice, but you know, a desert feels hot, a mountain feels cold. So researchers in virtual reality do this trick very well with any kind of device. This is just one example here. They use heat lamps to create a sense of, you know, hot because really they're heating up the air. Sometimes there's air conditioning. There's some incredible VR arcades in Tokyo that you can go and try out. They have ski simulators with air conditioned units. Joanne has tried it once. It's, it's pretty immersive. And, and of course you're seeing where this is going, right? This is again at odds with the idea that I can just walk around and have a hyper miniaturized setup in my living room that all lives in the VR headset. So again, the goal here is to make this more efficient. And we're taking again, a very weird turn here. This is a more chemical route into the body. Uh, and the experience that you're about to see, and I'm gonna just try to give you guys sound. So hang on a second, just to, where are we? Do I have a cursor? Yes, there we go. Let's see if this works. And hopefully it's not too loud. No, oh, I don't know how to make the sound work. Oh, there we go. So in this experience, there is no physical change of the environmental temperature of the room. The air is at 25C, it's a controlled lab room. But this person is feeling all kinds of things. Right now, she's feeling that there's some furnace in the room virtual that is heating up their hands. And the only device she's wearing is this contraption, which just for the purpose of visualization, I'm showing you some fog because we're injecting very, very small amounts of particles that she's breathing in. Now, the question is, why would we do that? Like, how would we create the sense of temperature through the nose? It just seems like not what the nose is good at. It turns out that in the nose, much like in the rest of your body, a lot of the nerves, especially skin type of nerves, but especially the trigeminal nerve, which is primary innervation nerve in, in the septum walls and in the nose, is sensitive to both temperature changes. So I hope you can see there if it exceeds 45 degrees, one particular type of receptor fires. If it decreases below 20C at the receptor level. So 20C at the inside of your nose would be very cold. 20C or 10C in this case, 10C, another type of receptor fires. Awesome. So far, that's the normal behavior of all th thermal receptors in your body. Except they also have this weird property, which is that it can also be chemically stimulated. And all of you know this, oops, all of you know this very well because you've had like spicy food, right? Maybe some chili oil or some Indian food and you felt hot. Now you know that it's because of the food because contextually you're eating and being chemically stimulated, you start sweating, that's thermal regulation kicking in. But the cell that got fired doesn't know exactly what pathway it just took, just fires, right? And so that's what we're gonna do here. What we're projecting in this case is small amounts of capsaicin, like minute, minute 0 0.01 microliter, diluted heavily in a buffer, and then she inhales it as she's in VR. So capsaicin sort of raises the temperature and she feels that furnace air. And then the wind comes kind of blows the cabin door open and we start projecting eucalyptal. I'm sure you, all of you had a breath mint and you felt very refreshed with the breath mint. That triggers the antagonist receptor, the other receptor, the cold receptor, and creates a cooling sensation. I won't play the rest, but it's kind of fun. You know, she goes outside, it gets colder and colder. We emit eucalyptal at higher frequencies. Eventually she finds some backup generator, comes inside, it's, it's a fun demo. Um, what I really want to highlight though, and you can watch the rest on YouTube if you're interested, is again, this is just an illusion. It's not as effective as real temperature, et cetera, et cetera. I can talk about a lot of the details, but it worked extremely well. And the power consumption is ridiculous because all we have to do, we use an ultrasonic transducer, create a small droplet, we put the droplet on the vibrating mesh and pff, atomize it and pulverize it and you inhale it. To power an ultrasonic transducer, I need a quarter of a watt. And this is because we're not even optimizing anything. Over there, it was on a kilowatt level, right? Air conditioned units, heating units. So it's a really, really like large disparity of the tricks we can do when we sort of go to the body and the tricks we can't do if we're just externally stimulating your whole environment and trying to recreate environmental conditions. And again, I think this is an example of the sort of mantra that I told you earlier. What are the minimum set of components to biologically induce these tricks rather than externally induce these tricks? Um, and in fact, my student Jasmine took this to the extreme, a really beautiful piece of work called Chemical Haptics two years ago at WIST, in which she kind of just acknowledged that, you know, it's not just our nose that has these cells, like all our skin cells are chemically reactive. And so what you see here is a VR demo. Nuclear reactor overheating. Please report to control room immediately. 
in which you use the control on the arm to navigate. It's a nuclear reactor, so eventually there's a malfunction and you're trying to save the reactor to meltdown. But when this explosion happens, your arm interface sort of glitches and it's you know malfunctioning. You can see the electrical sparks coming out of it. Instead of doing the cliche thing that you know haptics people, us would do, which is to use vibration and give you the sense of electricity through vibration, what Jasmine is doing here, I hope you can see that the blue line is moving. So this is a chemical that is moving on an open face channel to your skin. Your skin slowly absorbs this chemical. This chemical is called sensual. It's also a extract of a spice is the Sichuan pepper. And it creates a slow vibration. This one is really interesting, but of course you can do all kinds of other tricks. She goes into the cold, blasting cold, Chicago-like cold, and she makes a eucalyptal, no, sorry, menthol in this case, pass through the cheeks. Mentally even slightly more powerful than in terms of its cooling. Um, triggering stimulation, and especially the area here is extremely thin. So this feels super cold. If you ever go to my lab, ask Jasmine to try this. This is like really Chicago cold, brutal cold. Um, of course, this chemical pathway is really fun. Like we had a lot of fun with this. You can do cooling, menthol, warming with capsaicin. You can do things that would otherwise mechanically be very dangerous to do, right? Like if you wanted to learn what you're seeing here is someone learning how to, what to do in an event that they're in a chemistry lab and like they let something fall. And people actually usually have the wrong type of reaction. We had to be trained about this too. The, the first thing to do is not to come and clean this area. The first thing to do is to you know, clean your eyes and all that before you start cleaning surfaces and all that is make sure that everything is safe. And so here we're giving people like this panic feeling, this really like urgency to deal with a wound because they're feeling this stinging by cinnamaldehyde. This is an extract from um, cinnamon bark. Now, what's interesting is, of course, we're doing a very safe dosage of cinnamaldehyde. If we wanted to like mechanically pinch you with some mechanical device, it's not easy. We've tried to do that. It's not easy to try to do it in a safe way that wouldn't hurt you. And of course, we can do weird things too. Like if you see over there, that's lidocaine, right? To remove sensation. Maybe you've experienced lidocaine at the dentist or something like that. They do it injected lidocaine. This is topical lidocaine. This is very weak, but it feels almost like a ghost arm type of sensation. So you're touching, you have like, huh. A reduced feeling of tactile sensation. This was my crazy idea, but a lot of VR games use this metaphor where something is disabled and it becomes a ghost arm. And I really wanted to feel that ghost arm becoming disabled. So I wanted to try that out. So again, it's just an example. People have done a number of mechanical approaches to explore all these sensations I've shown you by no means, except perhaps, you know, the lidocaine approach. All these can be done more effectively with our devices, just end up with really large devices. And in fact, every time you want to switch from one modality to another, you have to physically switch another device or have a really compounded base device with all these things. In Jasmine's approach, you just switch the chemical, right? You switch the chemical, you have a new haptic device. You want to switch from hot to stinging, this chemical to that chemical, sanchul or capsaicin to cinnamaldehyde, for example. All right. Um, so I kind of feel like at this point in the talk, I li lied a little bit to you in the sense that I said, oh, this is going to be about integrating devices with the body. And then I've only talked about output, which is, you know, what us haptics people call output, just computer communicating physically to your body. But there was no input from the user. It's not like we were measuring the user. There was no information being passed except realism in VR, like sense of temperature, sense of walls, etc. So let's close this loop and let me show you a few examples of what happens when you think of the body as the input device and the output device, sort of like more akin to the first one, the muscle plug. That was a truly input output system. I'm drawing, computer's drawing too. We're sort of having a dialogue. And we've done a lot of work on this space. I won't bother you with the old work I did in my PhD, but I just wanna start here on the sort of more training and how can we imagine the future interfaces might help us learn physical skills. I personally think we're in a really interesting time where like learning stuff is beautiful. I mean, when I was a kid, it's very different from when I go now on YouTube and I have this plethora of knowledge and I can watch videos, equations, all the things and solve them at home. Except when I wanted to learn something physical. If I wanna learn how to juggle, it's, YouTube is not that helpful. It is helpful, but to visually see that and map to my own movements and proprioception and how does my body from my egocentric perspective match what I see 2D in some other person is very, very difficult. And so you can see where this is going, right? We're trying to do that sort of to each individual. What you see here is a uh, work by my, at the time, intern, now postdoc, Akifumi Takahashi. 
And, and here we're electrically stimulating individual fingers so as to help someone learn the piano. And this is like the James Bond beginning of the song. I don't know if you're familiar with that tune. And so what's happening here is maybe you've noticed that we've switched the stimulation location. We used to do it here. Now we're in the back of the hand. Turns out that's more precise for some interesting anatomical reasons. But also the fun thing is now we can imagine someone sort of slowly picking up a skill by having the computer talk in the same language that that skill is comprised of. Piano playing is not comprised of watching someone play piano. It's comprised of feeling your muscles moving up and down to hit the keys, the tempos, and all that. This is still very precarious. You saw how like it didn't feel very articulated and beautiful, but you know, we're getting there very slowly. And what was really fun and the reason why Aki got the best demo award, this conference was held virtually. And so what Aki did as a demo normally would bring all the hardware and do this demo for the 4,000 people at the conference. He just had the 4,000 people control him over Zoom. So he didn't know what they were gonna select as melodies to play. And his hands were just being played by this audience. And I think that was kind of fun to be on the controlling side as well. And so he ended up getting a, a best demo award at that conference. Now, as I was mentioned, this is still limited. And the key limitation that I want to point out, besides those ones that are there, is the same that was hidden in here. This is actually a study that I did with that muscle plotter interface. And sometimes I would give this talk and say, oh, the people ask me, well, so what's the accuracy? And I'd say, okay, on average, this is four millimeters off. People get very excited. They think four millimeters is great. But first, four millimeters is larger than, you know, a little kanji or hiragana. It's like really, really a big letter, four millimeters. And second, the problem is not the four millimeters off because it seems to be able to follow some shapes unless they're really crazy, but you can't stop. It's constantly oscillating around targets, right? If you're a control loop theorist, you're like, oh, this has, you know, oscillation problems. So it's very okay at following the, the sort of overall shape, like a low pass filter, overall shape, but it cannot pause on the target. So if I wanted to move a finger, to play a piano note, not all the way. We can't do it very well. We sort of have to push all the way. The piano key was physically stopping the previous demo. So we've been trying to move into like a territory where we can teach people more complex things. We would love to like have someone learn how to play the guitar, but that sometimes requires to play complex shapes that don't stop all the way or have someone, for example, sign in sign language that requires your fingers to stop sort of halfway. And so what we're realizing is that maybe we can sort of combine the muscle stimulation that cannot stop with something that is very good at stopping. So what you see here is a project called Dextrans, stands for Dextrous Muscle Stimulation, done by Romain and Shen Yuan. But what you see here is someone, again, we did this demo as well at a conference, people could control Romain's hands to form like okay, five or six different guitar chords. He didn't know what guitar chord was coming, and this hand would sort of form like a B minor or like whatever it was, E minor and something like that. And this requires a higher level of precision to be able to stop. So the way we do this is because we're combining the muscle stimulation with a small exoskeleton that is designed only for stopping. This is not designed for moving, so that's why it's small, designed only for stopping. And I think this demo illustrates it better. This is UJ and Romain talking. UJ is talking in sign language, which Romain does not understand. So she asks him a question, what's your major? And he uses a camera app that you gym in actually to translate just the visuals to text. And then he responds in text, sort of Google Translate, okay? But he doesn't know how to say HCI, which would be standing for human computer interaction, that's Romain's major. So he just sends those three letters to the glove and the glove is gonna actuate his fingers to achieve those three symbols. Now, as I said, normally, if we were just trying to do this with muscle stimulation, if we're very imprecise, we would not be able to stop in the right place. So we're kind of cheating here. The first thing we do, I hope you can see this is called a pull and ratchet, you know, old school system for breaks, right? What we do is first, we lock the fingers that should not move. This one, this one, this one, you don't move. And then we just apply the most brute force muscle stimulation ever, the most imprecise. We don't even care if it moves all of them together. That's great because the ones that should not move have already been locked. And the same thing happens when the finger reaches the right target. We like, we have a camera observing the fingers. Oh, it's at 45 degrees, great, lock it. And then turn off the muscle stimulation. So the result is these much more precise shapes. That's a C, look at how it stops like that. 
and that's an eye. Look at how like there's different fingers up, different fingers down, and it's much more precise. It's not perfect sign language, and I want to point out that these are easy symbols. We chose them because these are very easy letters to finger spell. We can't do any of the crazy complexity of sign language. But this is by far, you know, the most precise kind of muscle stimulation we've seen. Um, Romain uh, and, and the co-authors in this project actually are featured in the Guinness World Book of Records because someone in the Guinness team thinks this is the most precise controller out there. I'm not entirely sure if that is true, but, but to their point, I think to see this sort of finesse output that goes beyond, you know, just a shaking hand going up and down with a sine wave, I think it is the right direction to go in terms of physical demonstration abilities. And of course, you can also see the underlying theme in this thread of research is kind of like, oh, we can definitely extend abilities that you already have. All of us can move our muscles. It's just a question of, can you move them better? And we've so slowly been wondering, June's PhD is fantastic on this topic if you're more interested in this stuff. Like, can you give people new abilities? Maybe abilities that they just don't natively have. Um, and I promised to show you what the hell was that smell device in the nose. So that's an attempt to create the quote unquote like stereo, stereo smell. So normally we do not have stereo smell, just to be very clear, when you inhale the two nostril information gets fused here and then goes to the olfactory bulb. What we're doing here is putting this electrical device in the nose and allowing someone to feel sort of like little tingle sensations on left nostril versus right nostril to locate smells. This is especially interesting if you connect this to a device that can sense gases or odors that you cannot sense, like carbon dioxide concentrations, a toxical chemical, things like that. So what you see here in this demo is Shen Yuan in his kitchen, he's cooking, he's wearing the device, he forgets the gas on. To make matters worse, he's also making toast, which is something he likes to do. And the burn smell of the toast, of course, masks the gas smell, which by the way, the reason why gas has a smell, it's an added smell so we can detect gas leaks. But with this device, every time he inhales, it's detect connected to a gas sensor and he feels a tingle on the left nostril telling him the orientation of the gas leak. So he's essentially sort of self-locating by inhaling and sort of feeling these different smell sensations, which are kind of a strange thing to say smell, they're more like tactile sensations, but they're sort of halfway between smell and tactile. And this case is connected to a Bluetooth sensor. And that's how he finds the gas leak. Um, this paper is super fun. If you're interested in how we did the study, people were sort of navigating virtual spaces with virtual orders, and they were locating it just based on these degrad degradations. There's like eight directions we can do, uh, sort of in-betweens. And they were navigating. And then we also put them navigating real odor spaces, like put a little fan with a real smell in the room, and we can compare their behavioral ways that they navigate these two things. And turns out they can use this stuff without any training. We put people, give them this device. We don't even say what it does. We don't say left means left, both means center, a little bit more here means more left. No, we just, hey, use this device and they're like extremely good at it. So it's very intuitive somehow. Um, all right, I wanna just kind of getting closer to the end. I just wanna point out that this idea that I'm starting to think about this transition between wearables to a more integrated type of thinking has really fun sort of problems inside of it. That's why, you know, Shun and I started working together is because this looks very neat on the diagram, but the reality is I think there's a giant abysm when you jump from here to here. Because if my wearable smartwatch, do something and I go there and do something, I know very clearly that I went there and I initiated this action. But if I'm playing guitar and all of a sudden it sort of self-corrects the pose and like, you should be here. And it just does it. I'm like, who did this? I'm like, it's a very complicated type of shared agency where like it's overriding my own sense of control and my own sense of initiative. And so that question of agency became kind of so important in the lab that, you know, together with you know, almost all these papers are <laughs> co-authored with him, we've, we've really embraced this idea of how to understand what it means to sort of mechanically or, or electrically alter someone's sense of agency. What happens with these new types of devices that are more hybrid? Um, it's a really fun space because you can collaborate with all kinds of people. We've done uh, art shows. This is a sculpture. I can show you the video in the end if you're interested. This is a, a sculpture that very like aggressively violates your sense of agency, controls people. And we had this at Ars Electronic. It's an exhibition with like 50,000 people every day and trying this out. Really beautiful to see like families and what people think about all this and how they are able to start a dialogue about machines taking over control, et cetera. But we can also wear other kinds of hats. We can talk to our friends in neuroscience 
some work I did with Jacob and, and Carl and, and Felix. And here we were actually, I don't know if you can see here, there's two electrodes here. So what we were doing here is we're having these participants go inside an fMRI, we're scanning their brain as they're doing this task. And the task was very simple. Either I would go in the microphone and say, please tap to the rhythm. And they would voluntarily to, to tap to some beat that they were practiced on. Or I would say, please relax. And the muscle stimulation would take over and tap to that rhythm. And so what we could do, and I'm not gonna obsess over the results of this, it's a fun paper, um, is we could kind of map in your brain, sort of which areas understood that you had voluntary control, which areas did not understand that you had voluntary control, and what are the implications of that? And it's really fun stuff because actually your sense of touch gets very distorted if you're voluntarily doing something or if you're just letting something take over, you feel touch differently, which is really, really cool. And that's what this paper ends up being about. Um, and then, you know, really the part that is more fun for us is wearing our normal everyday hat of human computer interaction researchers and trying to maybe solve this question of agency or at least have some creative ideas on how to solve this. Um, and so this is a project that actually June and Shun started together where they were exploring this sort of reaction time tests. If you've ever been to the doctor and they want to measure your reaction time, sometimes they use this pen drop test. Doctor drops the pen, you're supposed to grab. And of course, the closer it is, the harder it is to do, and et cetera, et cetera, because you don't have just enough reaction time to sort of grab it. Jun and, and, and Shun had this brilliant idea of, OK, let's put muscle stimulation on it. We can add some sensor over here. The moment I see the pen being dropped by the second user, the first user automatically grabs it. And it works really well, you can ask them. But they also found out something very interesting, which is some participants said, like, I, this is amazing, you know, wow, I could grab the pen, but I'm not sure if I did it. You know, I'm not sure if I was the one who grabbed the pen. And so that's how the three of us got together one day at Sony and started talking about whether there's any other way to do this experiment that you just saw. And so I'll just plot what we thought our first hypothesis was, which is, you know, on the y-axis sense of agency, higher means 100% sure it was me, low means I didn't do this thing, and reaction time. So the reaction time is slow. I have no, I have a full sense of agency, right? High agency, but uh, I can't catch the pen. That's the baseline condition where you're at. You're not fast enough for doing it, but you're absolutely in control. You can plot your sort of personal fastest reaction time. You can want to think of this as an average human being is like 250, 270 milliseconds, something like that. And what they were doing at the time was this. As soon as that system detected the pen was going to be released, it would fire the muscle stimulation right as fast as possible. That sounded very intuitive. Like, let's show these people how fast they could be with this integrated assistance. It sounded very intuitive. But that's when they reported this sort of low sense of agency. So we start asked a very simple question at the time. What happens if we delay this reaction time, this assisted reaction time, closer and closer and closer to your voluntary threshold? Now, of course, we cannot go too close. Go over here, that's pointless because now you're not grabbing the pen. Like, that's just confusion. But what if it's, is it here also zero? Is it here also zero? Zero? Is it just a step curve? And we, we were very honest at the beginning. I actually was a, sort of a naysayer. I said, I think it's going to be a step curve. It's not going to work. I think people will detect the tactile impulses and they'll be displeased. They will say no. But what happened was actually slightly different. Again, this is work with Chun and Jun. And I won't bother you with the details of the experiment, but it's a pretty cool setup that June and Chun have made. Um, and what we found out is something more like this. There is a curve here. And this curve is kind of interesting because what is actually happening is that as you get closer to your own voluntary reaction time, you start to have an ability to see the pen falling, generate the intention. That's a great thing. Without intention, agency seems to be kind of violated. You say, yes, I want to move. You maybe even send the command down to move. It's just that that all takes a little bit of time. And we're kind of just shortcutting the very last section of it, to kind of helping you get, because we just need to go from here to here, and we don't have to go from here to here. We don't have to plan. We don't have to do anything, right? And so that's why sometimes you see a couple of interesting spots in this curve where, for example, some people over there, those maximums, do I have a cursor? Yeah. What is that over there? These are folks saying I had full sense of agency, though they were preempted by quite a lot. So they were very confident, you know, telling the two of them, I did it. And they are like, okay, <laughs> I can see the data and I don't think you did it. 
And, and of course, you can also start to trade off. And this is really fun, I'll be very honest, because we proposed this trade-off without really knowing what this trade-off was for. And you know, the reviewers of this paper were still a little like, this trade-off sounds kind of not, not 100% there. And we just said, maybe there's some use case where a designer might want to trade off and say, if I'm helping you learn something, I'll speed you up, but not too much, so you can retain a little bit of agency. And we thought this would be a good idea. Took us a little bit of time to find out, and I'll show you later that that trade-off is actually really cool. Um, here's an example. This person is not feeling the fastest muscle stimulation possible. The EMS was delayed by 80 milliseconds, and they feel like they did it. Um, and this is the paper with that trade-off. So it turns out the trade-off is really, really useful. So what we did in this paper is to train someone to do a reaction time with a muscle stimulation. So they come into the lab, and the first thing we do is just to measure their own reaction time. This is the baseline, right? How good are you? You see a light flash, and you hit the button like that. Then we train with a muscle stimulation in different conditions. One of them is the super fast one. Another one is this trade-off one, where we like, if you believe our previous results, there's a little bit of agency left over, and there's still a little bit of speed up. Not an immense speed up. And there's some other sham conditions just to make sure people are not hallucinating or getting better because they normally get better. This is a motor task, right? It's a bunch of baselines there too. We take off the electrodes, which is really important. This is the first time we were able to do a study like taking off the electrodes, and then we measure. And it turns out the group that has the highest speed up is not the group that saw the super fast muscle stimulation, and they would, could be a hypothesis where you'd say, oh my God, that is the group that got the speed up because they saw how fast bodies could be. No, the group that has the permanent sort of post-study speed up is the group with a sort of balanced agency and speed up, which is really cool. And, you know, they interviewed some of the participants and they talk about motivation and things like that. It makes sense, right? If the system is just doing things automatically for you, you just start coasting. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But if you feel like you're part of that equation, you're also the driver to this movement, you may be actually starting to get better, which is really cool. You could imagine like future video games where you have a power up with muscle stimulation. And then after a while, you don't even have the power up anymore, but you've learned like you're physically faster now, sort of your character has evolved and your skill physically has evolved. So we're kind of quite interested in this stuff too. I'll show one last thing and then I'll go into conclusions. Um, the last part that I've been interested in the last year or two, this is more recent work, is to try to use this analogy of human computer integration, not always in a literal form, but just as a metaphor to guide some of our decisions. And I've showed you one example where I thought we were pretty successful with that, which is to unite the idea of force feedback these four sensations like exoskeletons with VR that is highly mobile. These things were not in my field thought of compatible. And you know, I'm not saying this is a solution yet. You can't buy any of this stuff and you won't for many years, but here's a glimpse. It's possible. It's possible to have very miniaturized force feedback. And recently, this is the puzzle we've been kind of pondering about and done like four or five papers on it, which is this is the next thing they're gonna sell you at the shops. <laughs> the next thing they're gonna sell you in a few years is they're going to try to sell you augmented reality glasses. So here you're not seeing virtual environments that are completely closed off. I'm seeing all of you, but I can also have little projected names on it and things like that. That's called augmented reality, right? Of course, they're going to claim that augmented reality requires also feeling of touch. For example, if I'm going to hang up a call on Zoom, like that person over there, she's fixing an engine. She's also on Zoom. It's very hard to touch the hang up call button or any kind of digital button if you don't know where it's at. If you feel zero touch, it's very hard to gauge the depth and understand it. So of course, they're going to claim, oh, we need to have touch sensations, touch sensations to do that. Now, the problem of that is that the type of touch sensations people are envisioning in industry are those over there. So sort of glove style things with your finger pads are all covered up. And I think it's going to be impossible to fix this engine. It's going to be impossible to even put on and off the headsets. We've actually measured that in a recent study. It's impossible to type if you have a glove on, if you try to open your house with the keys while you have a glove on. What a disaster. I try that almost every day because it's cold in Chicago. And, and so this world seemed to be very incompatible. But I'm not saying we want to give up on either. We're like, we want to have touch sensations. We want to have augmented reality. And so let me just show you very quickly a, a recent paper published just a few months ago or a month ago also by Yudai Tanaka. And um, what we're doing here is that we're giving people physical touch sensations on their finger pads, but there is nothing attached to the finger pads. So this user here is climbing this rope and he feels the rich texture of the rope. 
but he can also touch these older walls, right? The like prop wall virtual thing. And he can feel that he's grabbing that. Actually, he feels a quite full hand sensation with many points. And the trick that we're doing is that we're electrically stimulating from the back of the hand rather than from the front of the hand. So you can think of this as sort of like intercepting a nerve that is anyway coming from here all the way from here. And then it's kind of like the nerve at the end sort of jumps down and we're intercepting it rather than here, we're intercepting at these different locations, right? And what's really cool is that we don't put anything on the front of the hand and we can generate touch sensations on the front of the hand coming from these strategic locations in the back of the hand. And again, there's lots of other projects on this topic of how to create tactile sensations on the finger pad without covering the finger pad. If you look at the only commonality between these four papers is that all the finger pads are uncovered and yet everyone here is feeling stuff at the finger pad. So different ideas, some are mechanical like folding structures, others are like some illusions. This is an illusion, it actually doesn't do anything but you feel like something happened and so forth, so forth. All right, so just really rapidly conclude, um, I think one idea here that I want you to think about is I don't have to make you force believe that this is the evolution of computing devices. This is just the thing, the way I tend to think about it, but I think it's a really interesting um, way to think about it. And I, I think we already have some hints of integrated devices out there, but definitely this biological integration approach yields devices that compared to the mechanical ones are really efficient in power and size, right? I showed you some examples of how smaller these things could be in the future. Um, it's interesting to think of like how to endow users with new abilities. This is a demo that Shunichi and made and took a SIGGRAPH where they essentially let people try to first um, take a photo of a very fast baseball flying out of the baseball can. And of course, without any kind of assistance, you can't do it. And then they instrumented the baseball cannon with this little detection mechanism and then actuate your finger on the shutter of a button on the camera to do that. And of course, people with this and with a delayed muscle stimulation can actually take those photos. So over there, you see that the ball is kind of in the middle, right, right there flying. And so that's an example of kind of an exaggerated way to endow people with, with abilities. Um, I wanna also mention just skipping almost to the end, that I'm talking a lot about nerve stimulation and electrical stimulation, but I think this notion of integration is quite more metaphorical and you maybe can take it to your own work in different ways. Even in our lab, we've sort of started to think of integration in different ways. I'll just highlight this project. I won't really explain what's going on, but my student Jasmine had a paper recently published at WIST that got a lot of press and sort of mainstream journals and, and you know, mainstream journals as in, you know, the New York Times or something like that because what she did was to integrate a living organism in a smartwatch to promote like a more intimate relationship with the devices that you have because you see that they're alive, like physically alive, biologically alive. And you have to take care of them every day and stuff like that. Somewhat akin to a real Tamagotchi, if you want to think about it. That's, that's how the press tend to pitch it. Um, and so I think this idea of integration might be even broader than the stuff I've been talking about just with nerve stimulation. And that's it. I want to just um, thank my team including some of our alumni, June is right there. And of course the folks on the left side are the ones that really did the work. I'm just here presenting in their behalf. That's it, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for the great fascinating talk as always. <laughs> thank you so much. So uh, we have a small time for uh, the question, uh, question or comment or something. So do you have uh, any comment or question? Um, or for generating the many others uh, generating the questions, I have a small question, mm -hmm. <laughs> a bit weird, but um, I'm always a so we actually always you know having a fun for exploring about uh, actions, so integration action. But uh, you might notice that, for instance, like a large, big, large language module like, like mm -hmm. a GPT or something, then it's also like a many computer power turn into the integrate with our more like for higher cognitive things. So do you have any idea or like a forecast of what happening on those kind of cognitive, like a higher level of action? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm the right person to answer that question because I, I don't know where those models are at yet in terms of their, their skill. Um, it feels a lot like mimicry. And I think to some degree, mimicry can be used to enhance your cognitive skills. I've seen some of my students using it in interesting ways where they use these 
computational models as large large language computational models is sort of like another person they can check things with. For example, they show a piece of text and say like, how much do you understand of it? And if the computer doesn't understand anything, they say like, okay, I'm gonna rewrite it myself until it seems understandable for this average reader, which is embodied in this computer. But they, they seem to use it more as an other agent rather than a sort of self referral thing. So they don't seem to integrate it in their own cognitive ability as more like it's another type of check they can run this thing. But I'm really just speaking anecdotally here as watching my students use ChatGPT. I've never really successfully used it for anything <laughs> myself. Um, I struggle finding actually useful use cases for it. Um, but I'm sure like the folks that do more natural language processing would argue in a very different way from me where they would you know, very fervently argue, no, 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 this is a great space for cognitive augmentations because it's speaking the language that we all speak, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know, maybe folks here know more, more than I do about this stuff. Yeah, uh, hopefully, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, great talk. Um, I wish you had, we had much more time to talk um, <laughs> and lots of interesting points of contact. But just one general thing uh, that, that came to my mind while, while looking at the different modalities in which you're interfacing. And as, you know, it's really nice to see that all these other modalities that are usually neglected mm -hmm. um, you know, actually can give very powerful results. Yeah. Um, but then it leads me to think, what about vision, right? Yeah. So, and you're, and all, you're still relying on a VR headset for a lot of what you do. And at the very end, you gave us the hint that, you know, augmented uh, reality is probably the next step. And I mm -hmm. agree that it makes sense that we don't want to walk around isolated from the rest of the yeah. world, visually speaking, right? Um, but can you use this kind of approach, this integrative approach to also work with the visual modality? Do you have any ideas there? That's a really, really good question. I haven't done much of that because I feel like I'm an impaired vision scientist, not not so so creative in that domain. But I've definitely seen a couple of hints here and there where people are not really just teaching you with visuals, but sort of modulating what you see. Mm -hmm. Or for example, there's a project where you throw balls and you see them going in a slightly different trajectory from the one they actually went. And that helps you sort of self-correct without even noticing your own trajectory. Right. And I think that's a very analog way of thinking of how do you take vision and sort of make it a more kind of integrated thing. We had a project for a while where we were trying to electrically do something. So the optical nerve and mostly just created flashes and you've maybe heard of those types of effects and we didn't find it that interesting, but there's something there that could be done as well. Um, one thing we've also been exploring, not super successfully, is whether we could give you a kind of real time way to kind of up value or down value a particular sense. So something that is sometimes very difficult for beginners in some of these physical tasks is that they over rely on visuals. And if you're doing, for example, piano playing or drumming or something like that, it's actually easier. And drumming teachers will tell you that, close your eyes. Mm. It's actually easier if you close your eyes. It's a more advanced skill to be doing a complicated polyrhythm and looking at your hands. That's actually a lot of conflicting visual information. Mm -hmm. And so we were thinking, can we help people get to that sort of downgrading one sense and upgrading mm. the other sense? Um, or that yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. So you had one video where you were directing people's attentions by actually moving their head, right? So if you something somehow like sail that down to the side of the eyes, yeah, and can do something to the saccades or something like that, because you know you might stand in front of the fridge and say, "Where's the mayonnaise?" and it's right there, exactly, exactly. right? But yeah, so Yudai's original goal was to electrically actuate saccades of the eyes. Okay. And turns out what we mostly could do is flash the optic nerve. Okay. Uh, we're still curious. Maybe we just didn't have the right parameters. But but like you said, we want to alter. A saccade, we could also show something that your eyes sort of natively follow. That's true. Right? A little object, and then all of a sudden I've directed you away from that. So I think you're right that this could all be applied to vision too. Because that probably is the biggest market, right? I mean, if vision, if you can crack vision with exactly, this approach. Exactly, because then you are like leveraging all these augmented reality interfaces that are yeah. to come very, very soon. Yeah, thank very, you. Very good point. Yeah. Thank you. Uh for your presentation, really interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask, do you ever also consider kind of like ethical dimension of these kind of yeah. uh, integrated interfaces? Yeah, like this is a really, really good question. Like, I'm gonna actually show the video. This, this is gonna scare you because you're asking about ethics and then the first thing I'm showing you is a scary video. But you, uh, you'll you see that I mean it in a, in a very, very ethical way. Um, the video of that, that artwork that I didn't show. Well, where's the video? There's here under subsection ethical implications <laughs> by, by coincidence. Um, so this thing is actually an art piece 
that we had in several museums all over the world. This has traveled quite a bit, US, Berlin, San Francisco twice, Dublin, etc. And all you can do is like put your arm in there. Put your arm in there. It kind of traps you in this contraption, mechanically traps you. And I don't know if you can see, but there are electrodes, the white patches connected there. They electrically force your muscles up and down. There's an electrical generator, like what was cranked flashlight inside. And it generates energy for the artwork to continue living. So it's literally like a parasite machine that is living off her energy forever. The only way you can get rid of it is to convince somebody else to sit on the other side, like physically convince, hey, this is really fun, you know, come, come try this out. And they get trapped and you get released. And that's how this whole thing keeps on running forever, which is really, really fun. And, and especially at museums and arts electronic, it's just like the batteries will eventually run out. This is not a perpetual motion machine, but it can live like five hours easily. And, and it's kind of fun. And what the reason why we did this was to generate this discussion, to have people be in a room and talk about, you know, how these interfaces can take control, how maybe even other interfaces have taken control. And it was really fun, especially at Ars Electronica, but also like in San Francisco and stuff. I could walk around, nobody knows like these things that don't know that I made this. I was just listening to the conversations and I could really see people reflecting on some of these questions that you're asking, like, what are the limits? What, they never gave like, consent to go into this thing. I mean, in the museums, you have to sign some kind of waiver, but it's not an informed proper consent. And so they were starting to ask questions. I've heard people say, oh, in VR, maybe there should be a consent at the beginning and things like that. That's exactly the kind of discussion that you want to have. The other side that we do to try to make this, you know, as interesting as possible and as transparent as possible is all the devices that I've shown you throughout the talk are all open source in some form of another. And, and some of the devices, even other people have used it or like dissected it and try to understand it better. So we're not sort of closing it and selling it, you know, copyright to companies or sort of saying, if any of these things should happen, here's a number of ways that we can all look inside of it. Um, and then another like third part of that ethics question, which I find really interesting. And I used to have a slide about, I don't know if you still have it. Do I still have it? Yeah, the turn off, on and off device. Does this work? No, um, let me show you is how do you turn on and off these devices, which I find a kind of an interesting question. So um, it's kind of three ways we do it. Don't worry too much about the project names, but we try to keep users always in control. And so one strategy that we've had is there's some kind of gesture that anytime you do that gesture, the system turns off completely. The other one, this is a bit more popular. We use this in more projects is if you move against what the stimulation is doing. So let's say the stimulation is saying, go right, and you just move a millimeter to the left. It senses that that millimeter to the left is voluntary and turns off the other one, right? And sort of hardware level turn off, not software level. And in other projects, we've also done a thing where if the muscle stimulation starts, say, trying to show you how to drum over here, if you move over here, it turns off. So you, you know you have like a safe area where it's sort of like GPS fenced, you know, drones also do this technique. Here it works. Here it does, and if I want muscle stimulation, I voluntarily go to this location, right? So we've been exploring a little bit of how to turn it on and off, how do we have levels of control. Drun had a really beautiful work during his PhD where he can also measure voluntarily how much the users are moving and close the loop in even more elegant ways than these ones, which I think could also be used for enhancing the form of control if you want to. Um, but I think, yeah, this is a really fun question. We actually try to do more work in this area because we find it really important to think how to give control in a proper way. Yeah, it's an awesome question. Yeah, thank you, that's a very uh, satisfying answer. <laughs> and may, maybe also like tangentially to mm -hmm. that, have you also considered like potential social implications of you know widespread adoption of these sort of interfaces? Yeah. Only very recently we started thinking of, you know, what happens if more than one person, right? But these are devices that we made in the lab. You can only experience them by going to my lab and somebody sets it up. It's all very like laboratory style. But we started to think about if we had a device like this that could be in a public setting, what would that you know, allow to? And we don't really know. Obviously they all look very weird. So from a social acceptability angle, they all pretty much fail right now. But I think from a skill angle it would be interesting to imagine if there's something that you could sort of go to like a gym or something where many people could be enjoying this type of learning or physical skill learning. And I don't know if that's socially unifying or socially sort of disentangling people from each other, which is always something we, we want to avoid. Um, I'm sure you're familiar, there's lots of theories that say when one group gets an augmentation, they sort of become a specialized group. Right? We, you want to 
that this does not become one of those, which is why I liked so much the, the paper we did last year about removing the electrodes. That seemed interesting because I don't want to create interfaces that you're augmented when you have them, but battery runs out and all of a sudden you're not, you didn't learn anything. You didn't take home anything with you. But this type of physical skills are really just the type of training. The question is, can you accelerate this training? But you could obtain it another way. And I like the idea that it's just a momentary thing and you take it off and now I'm faster at this. I'm better at baseball. I'm better at piano, but you're permanently better. It's built into your brain, your muscle memory, quote unquote. I know the neuroscientists don't like that term. <laughs> yeah, this is a really good question. I don't have a satisfying answer for that one at all, but it's an awesome question. Yeah, go for it. Uh, hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, really interesting and uh, really cool demos. <laughs> Um, I was wondering, where do you see the main applications for all of these? Do you, do you think it's going to be more in the, you know, let's say, quote unquote, normal space? Yeah. Or is it going to be in the more, you know, uh, dealing with disorders or diseases space? Yeah, that is a really, really excellent question. I don't want to uh, oversell that the things I'm doing are entirely devoid from applications and that a lot of them are inspired by folks in the rehabilitation space that are already using maybe a milder version of this for these types of, you know, impairments or something like that. Um, so I think the realistic answer, if I, I'm really bad at, you know, entrepreneur and, you know, thinking of long-term company visions, I'm terrible at that. That's why I'm a researcher, not a <laughs> entrepreneur. But I do think that, you know, that is the obvious path. This has clear sort of assistive applications, you know, like, I'm showing a very extreme example of taking a photo faster, but that's not what immediately one would need. What one would need is, can I grab this thing that I'm about to let fall because I have some form of motor impairment, a degenerative uh, neuronal disease where your muscles sort of start like to sh shield, the, the shed the myelination and become slower over time. So your reflexes are really poor. There you go. That's a much more clear type of application that you could imagine like in a five year, 10 year time frame. Whereas I'm excited about sort of like larger widespread things, but I agree with you that those are going to come much later and they're so dependent on a chain of things that might never happen. You know, VR, uh, VR working out, AR becoming mainstream and truly all the tracking problems are solved the, 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 until muscle stimulation can come in and, and solving some inherent problems with muscle stimulation to tingling sensations and other stuff. So, so I think you're right. I think there's a very beautiful, interesting path and immediate adoption. If you go to like some the medical conferences, June has been to EMBC, for example, folks will, will treat these types of works in a much more applied, immediate way for sort of assistive technology. Whereas I'm sort of just provoking a little bit more of the longer time frame and asking like, okay, what about 50 years out? What would happen if in the 50 year time frame we're all here interacting with computers in a slightly different way? I mean, we still have laptops and everything, but He's like controlling the questions and the zoom through the muscles and feeling how the zoom controls him, things like that. I think that's the time frame that I'm kind of more curious about. But it'll take a long time for widespread adoption. Yeah. Maybe never. This is an awesome question. I think there's some question there too. Sure. Hopefully we have enough time. Yeah, yeah just a short question uh, about the uh, agency and intention thing mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier with the pen drop. <sighs> yeah. Now I have to think about how to say this properly. Basically, can you give people a wrong sense of agency? <laughs> yeah. that they don't actually intend it yeah, to do good. something, but believe they did because it yeah. happened at the right time? Yeah. Like, do I still have that one? I don't have it. Um, so we, we the last late, latest paper that the, the, the three of us collaborated on um, is precisely that. I was just looking through slides, backup slides, to see if I had at least a photo, you could see what I mean. So the latest one is precisely that. We are allowing people to choose sort of a left. Oh, I do have a, at least you can see a small photo of it. Here we go. At least you see a glimpse of it. Does this show? This one, forget that. You see here, there's two hands and there's sort of a left, right decision. Okay, so now we could play that game. So here you have choice because here we already, you're a very, like, very good observation because you caught the, Assumption here, we told participants to align their intention with the machine's intention. We said, your goal is to grab the pen, machine's goal, grab the pen. We don't want you to like, not grab the pen. This is not a go, no go test. This is a go task. Here, there was decision like, you got to see something and think whether you want to turn your car to the left or turn your car to the right. There's a mental decision. And we knew the right or wrong. This is a decision with rights or wrongs. And so we could now do a matrix thing. 
all right? Where we can say, oh, the system helps you, where the system on purpose gets the wrong answers. We can kind of play that game. And what we found out is that if the system forces you to make a mistake, the drop-in agency is even more dramatic, but also interesting, even if you make a mistake voluntarily, right? So no, it's not the system's fault, but the outcome is negative, you made a mistake, you also experience a slight drop of agency, which suggests that the outcomes, and this is a sort of well-known thing in psychology, the outcomes of a task seem to bias people a little bit more than we would like to believe. But So there's a little bit of biasing by outcome, but there's also a lot of biasing by like what you said, it's forcing you to do, I want it to go left. And it clicked faster than me. And it went, right, this is wrong. It crashed the car because of that. This is just wrong. And so there's an even sharper decrease of agency to the point that it almost looks like the step curve that we were talking about at the beginning. So it's a, it's a really good point. When you play this, we call it adversarial role. Play that adversarial role, the decrease in agency is just super sharp. Excellent question, really good observation. Uh, so I follow up with the same Yeah, go for it. About. How many mm -hmm. subjects have you? Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat, because I don't know if there's still people on Zoom. The question was, um, how many subjects? Yeah, I think, yeah, most of these have around 10, 12, 20 subjects. So 20 years, 20 years, 20 years. Something along along those numbers, so small small sample sizes. What was it like? Uh, it was it person dependent and like different. Surprisingly, not as dependent as person dependent as one would have assumed. In all three, surprisingly, you go see the sort of deviations inter subject differences are very 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 small. What I think maybe is the sharpest one is on the speed up one. I don't know if you were here when I showed this one. This is about just becoming permanently better by training with muscle stimulation. This has a lot of correlates with just how good you are at motor training. So over here, the deviations are a little larger. The effect size becomes smaller because you're starting to see, oh, that person is just excellent in all conditions. They did get better in the condition we hypothesized, but they're also just really good at training and speeding up. So less here and here and a little bit more of motor training, raw motor training. It's a really good point, yeah. Great. Great. Okay. Okay. So thank you for a very kind of good yeah, discussion. Great question. Thank very you. nice question. Thank you so much. So uh thanks for whoever was on Zoom too. <laughs> I think Zoom, from Zoom maybe I, I we didn't get any mm -hmm. questions. So I think it's time to close the talk. So let's give the speaker the another round of applause. Please, thank you. Thank you so much.